Do you ever find yourself thinking about the planetary motion of planets and artificial satellites when applying the relationships between gravitational force, centripetal force, centripetal acceleration and mass? Well, here is some information that will satisfy your curiosity. A planet is an astronomical spherical object orbiting a star that is massive enough to be rounded by its own gravity. In the early 1600s, Jonas Kepler proposed three laws of planetary motion. Kepler was able to summarize the carefully collected data of his mentor, Tycho Brahe, with three statements that describe the motion of planets in a sun-centered solar system. So in order to understand the orbital motion of planets, we must take a look at Kepler's infamous three laws of planetary motion. Kepler's first law, also called the law of ellipses, explains that planets are orbiting the sun in a path described as an ellipse. All planets orbit the sun in a path that resembles an ellipse, with the sun being located at one of the foci of that ellipse, the foci being one of the center points of an ellipse. Kepler's second law, also referred to as the law of equal areas, describes the speed at which any given planet will move while orbiting the sun. The speed at which any planet moves through space is constantly changing. A planet moves fastest when it is closest to the sun and slowest when it is furthest from the sun. Yet, if an imaginary line were drawn from the center of the planet to the center of the sun, that line would sweep out the same area in equal periods of time. For instance, if an imaginary line were drawn from the Earth to the Sun, then the area swept out by the line in every 31-day month would be the same. This is depicted in the diagram below. As can be observed in the diagram, the areas formed when the Earth is closest to the Sun can be approximated as a wide but short triangle, whereas the areas formed when the Earth is farthest from the Sun can be approximated as a narrow but long triangle. These areas are the same size. Since the base of these triangles are shortest when the Earth is farthest from the Sun, the Earth would have to be moving more slowly in order for this imaginary area to be the same size as when the Earth is closest to the Sun. Kepler's third law, or the law of harmonies, compares the orbital period and radius of the orbit of a planet to those of other planets. Unlike Kepler's first and second laws that describe the motion characteristics of a single planet, the third law makes a comparison between the motion characteristics of different planets. The comparison being made is that the ratio of the squares of the periods to the cubes of their average distances from the Sun is the same for every one of the planets. As an illustration, consider the orbital period and average distance from Sun orbital radius for Earth and Mars as given in the following table. Observe that the ratio is the same for Earth as it is for Mars. Kepler's third law provides an accurate description of the period and distance for a planet's orbits around the Sun. Additionally, the same law that describes the ratio for the planet's orbits around the Sun also accurately describes the ratio for any satellite about any planet. To put this law in simpler terms, the ratio of the squares of the periods of any two planets is equal to the ratio of the cubes of their average distances from the Sun. The planets travel around the Sun in paths or orbits called ellipses. When an object moves in a circle, its speed remains constant, but as the direction is constantly changing, so is its velocity. This is because velocity has size and direction, whereas speed only has size. For an object moving in a circle, a force is required to change the direction as defined by Newton's first law of motion. This force constantly pulls the object towards the center of the circle. A force that pulls an object towards the center of a circle is called centripetal force. Centripetal force can be demonstrated through a simple experiment involving the swinging of a bucket of water tied to a rope. The water's inertia wants to keep the water traveling in a straight path but gravity is acting on the water causing it to fall in a downward path that will eventually hit the earth. However, while the water is falling, the bucket is falling with it, catching the water. What keeps the bucket and water moving in a nice circular path that doesn't get wet or messy is the string. The string acts as the centripetal force that pulls the bucket and water into the center and keeps them from following their paths of inertia, giving the illusion that centrifugal force is pulling the water away from the center. The source for the centripetal force in the solar system is the gravitational force of the sun. Without the centripetal force from the sun, the planets would travel in a straight line. Similar to the bucket of water tied to a rope, the velocity of the planets is high enough so that they continuously accelerate towards the sun without ever leaving their orbits. It is for this reason that the planets do not fall into the sun from its strong gravitational force of attraction.
The gravitational force is a force that attracts any objects with mass. You right now are pulling on every other object in the entire universe. This is called Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation. Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation is a formula for understanding the relationship of gravity between two objects. The equation is the following, where F is the force of gravity, G is the gravitational constant, the m's are the masses of the objects being considered, and r is the radius of the distance between the two objects. Thus, the greater the mass an object has, and the closer they are together, the stronger the force of gravity. A planet's orbital speed changes depending on how far it is from the sun. The closer a planet is to the sun, the stronger the sun's gravitational pull on it, and the faster the planet moves. The farther it is from the sun, the weaker the sun's gravitational pull, and the slower it moves in its orbit. As seen in relation to Earth and Mars. A planet further from the sun not only has a longer path than a closer planet, but it also travels slower since the sun's gravitational pull on it is weaker. Therefore, the larger a planet's orbit, the longer a planet takes to complete it. The law of harmony suggested that the ratio of the period of an orbit squared to the mean radius of the orbit cube is the same value for all the planets that orbit the sun. Known data for orbiting planets suggested the following average ratio. Newton was able to combine the law of universal gravitation with circular motion principles to show that if the force of gravity provides the centripetal force of the planet's nearly circular orbits, then the following value could be predicted for the ratio. Here is the reasoning employed by Newton. Consider a planet with the mass of Earth to orbit in a nearly circular motion around the Sun of mass, mass of the Sun. The net centripetal force acting upon the orbiting Earth is given by the following relationship. This net centripetal force is the result of the gravitational force that attracts the planet towards the Sun and can be represented as... Since the gravitational force is equivalent to the net centripetal force, the above expressions for centripetal force and gravitational force are equal. Centripetal acceleration is the idea that any object moving in a circle in something called circular motion will have an acceleration vector pointed towards the center of that circle. An example of this can be seen when driving a car in a circle. Consider the following question. The Earth takes about 365 days to complete its orbit around the Sun. Approximating the orbit as perfectly circular, find the centripetal acceleration of the Earth. Three following assumptions will be given. Either orbital speed v or angular speed w can be used to calculate the centripetal acceleration, but is easier with the variables given since we consider the following expression. Where triangle S is the arc length transverse during one orbit and is the orbital period, we can calculate the orbital speed from substituting the assumptions into the expression. The orbital speed V is the tangential velocity in the expression for centripetal acceleration. So in solving this question, the answer for centripetal acceleration eventually equals 5.96 times 10 to the power of negative 3 meters per second squared. An artificial satellite is an artificial man-made body placed in orbit around the Earth or another planet in order to collect information or for communication purposes. For an example, the International Space Station. Satellites are placed in one of several different types of orbits depending on the nature of their mission. The two most common orbit types are low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit. Low Earth orbit is defined to be from 100 to 1,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. The space shuttle uses this type of orbit. Geostationary orbit is defined as one in which the satellite has a circular orbit in the Earth's equatorial plane with a period of 24 hours. A satellite in such an orbit remains above the same point on the equator at all times. As Newton's first law states, a moving object will continue to move in a straight line at the same speed unless a force acts on it. For an object to move in a circle, a force has to act on it all the time. This force is called centripetal force. It acts towards the center of the circle. Gravity is the centripetal force that keeps planets moving around the sun and satellites moving around planets. When an object is in space, it is actually in perpetual freefall. Nothing is holding it up against the force of gravity and it is constantly falling towards Earth with no resistance whatsoever.
The force of gravity is unopposed. Because there is no resistance, the material properties of the object simply do not matter. Explanations of this often involve a feather compared with something heavy. Yet how can something be constantly falling but never reach the ground? The reason is because it is also travelling sideways at very high speeds. This causes it to take a curved trajectory that misses the Earth and the reason why a satellite doesn't just fall back to Earth. The centripetal acceleration is proportional to the centripetal force, obeying Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. This is the component of the object's acceleration in the radical direction towards the center of the circle and its rate of change in the object's velocity as the object moves in a circle. The centripetal force does not change to the magnitude of the velocity, only the direction. You can connect angular quantities such as angular velocity to centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration is given by the following equation, where v is the velocity and r is the radius. Linear velocity is easy enough to tie to angular velocity because velocity equals radius times the angular speed. Therefore, you can rewrite the acceleration formula as... From here, the centripetal acceleration equation simplifies to The equation for centripetal acceleration means that you can find the centripetal acceleration needed to keep an object moving in a circle given the circle's radius and the object's angular velocity. To achieve and maintain a stable orbit around a planet, a satellite must have a certain velocity. In general, we define the term orbital velocity to be the velocity required by a satellite to enter and maintain a particular orbit around a celestial object. If we assume the orbit of the satellite around the celestial object is circular, we can use Kepler's third law to obtain an equation for the orbital velocity of the satellite, starting with the following equation where t equals to the period of the satellite around the central body, r equals to the distance from the center of the central body to the satellite, m equals the mass of the central body, g the gravitational constant, and substituting t equals 2pr over v for t we obtain where v equals to the orbital velocity of the satellite. In order to calculate the gravitational force between two objects with masses of m1 and m2, the equation is f equals to g times m1 m2 over r squared, where g is the gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11, r is the distance between the two objects, and f is the magnitude of the force between the objects. Mass refers to the amount of matter within an object. In terms of the relationship of mass and artificial satellites, the mass of the satellite definitely affects where it stays in the orbit, whether it be low Earth orbit or geostationary orbit. Gravitational force between the two objects is directly proportional to the product of their masses and indirectly proportional to the square of the distance between them. If a balloon is launched about 2 kilometers away from the Earth, it stays up. With its mass and being at that distance, the gravitational force on it could be zero. Same cannot be said of a metal ball of higher mass. Objects with higher mass will require longer distance for the force of gravity to be ineffective. Thank you, I hope you learnt something valuable from this video.